Above and beyond everything else, we need to understand that the kingdom lifestyle is a way of life founded on the grace of God. For the Christian to dwell in this lifestyle, they will need immeasurable quantities of God's grace. Grace is flowing like a river, so writes the songwriter. Millions there have been supplied, still it flows as fresh as ever from the Saviour's wounded side. There is a sense in which it is God's grace that provides the resources to live the kingdom lifestyle. And it will help us in our kingdom living if we can form some sort of understanding of the concept of grace. Either we live our lives under a set of stringent and binding laws, or we live under the umbrella of compassionate and forgiving grace. Law, by its very nature, is inflexible judgmental and reproving. It has little room for anything outside the rigid application of its words. On the other hand, grace is compassionate, understanding, accepting, loving and empathic. Various definitions have been applied to grace, none of them all that satisfactory. At best it can be described as God's desire and willingness to forgive my sins and to see me as a righteous person solely on the basis of my faith in Jesus' redemptive death and resurrection. It is in stark contrast of trying to live under a legalistic framework. Many of the parables of Jesus highlighted the grace offered by a gracious and loving God. Some even highlighting the difference between law and grace. They are poignant and focused stories that give us a glimpse of life in the kingdom of grace. Many of them start with the words, the kingdom of heaven is like, and they present us with a picture of life in the kingdom based on grace. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, 
There was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that
it would appear that while Jesus never used the word grace, his teachings are saturated with the undeserved favour of God, his grace. Perhaps above all his teachings, the parable of the prodigal son is the most obvious example of grace. In this parable, grace is extended to one who has no right or expectation, other than he asks in humility and repentance. Note that the prodigal son asks for acceptance as one of his father's workers. But the father, in an act of sheer grace, restores him to his position as son. We can well understand the anger of the other son in what seems a grossly unfair circumstance. In reality, the prodigal son should have been at least disowned. But grace is just the opposite. While it may be impossible to uh, put into words the full meaning of grace, the parable of the prodigal son may well be the closest illustration we can find. It is worthwhile noting that this parable is set against the background of the Jewish leaders questioning Jesus and his relationship to sinners. In response to their criticism, Jesus tells the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son. In all three parables there is joy in heaven when the lost is found and returned. Of the three parables, the parable of the lost son clearly demonstrates the essence of grace unmerited favour given freely to someone who is totally undeserving. Jesus wanted us to understand that grace is given freely, without restrictions, to those who are in no way worthy of it. It is God's gift to bring us into a right relationship with him, to justify us.
Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? he inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. In the story of the rich young ruler, we see the human conflict between law and grace. The young man is crucially concerned with keeping the law. But Jesus is more interested in challenging him to live a life of grace, to give freely, without restrictions or conditions, to those who are in no way worthy of it. While ever we are focused on rigid observance of the law in order that we can gain credit with God, we have ignored the rule of grace in our lives. The young man who came to Jesus was so obsessed and focused on maintaining an outward appearance of law-keeping, that he was oblivious to the heart of God, which is the heart of grace. It is in reproducing God's attitude of grace, in caring for those around us, that we obey the law of love. To follow Christ and in grace and generosity, to serve the men for whom Christ died, are one and the same thing.
just as our salvation was impossible without the grace of God. Our daily walk in the kingdom lifestyle is unachievable without it. We seriously delude ourselves if we think we can exist an hour, even a minute, without the grace of God sustaining everything we do. It is crucial in every facet of our Christian living and we need to be acutely aware of its reality. Grace is a gift given freely, without restrictions, to those who are in no way worthy of it. Grace was more than just simply unmerited favour. It is a favour bestowed on sinners who deserve wrath and punishment. Showing kindness to a stranger is charity. Doing good to one's enemies is more the spirit of grace. Without this acute awareness of God's grace operative within our lives, we must inevitably struggle and the kingdom lifestyle will become burdensome and unfulfilling. Whatever our circumstances, whatever our needs, whatever our situation, the grace of God is always there. There is no circumstance so difficult, no situation so stressful that can defeat the grace of God. Giveth and giveth 
while it is not recorded that Jesus ever used the word grace, the reality is that his teachings are saturated with the very essence of it. He himself is the visible manifestation of God's grace, and it is through him, and him alone, that God bestows his limitless grace on all of us, who would in repentance and humility receive and partake of it. Love he had for me, the burden of my